We set ourselves an objective, and our objective was to reduce by 1% per year the amount of garbage that we sent away. Uh, that doesn't sound like much, but when you consider that population and economic activity are typically increasing by a lot more than that, the, to actually turn that curve around and start taking it down, that's actually the step that you need to take. But the really good news is that in the first two years, we overachieved. We actually reduced our waste by, I think the last number I saw was 11%. And part of that was because we also were coinciding with the recession, which typically does reduce garbage. But we went in and looked at it, and we concluded that probably about half of that reduction was actually the result of the zero waste strategy. You know, the nice thing about the waste stream, as I said before, it's, it's so tangible and real. Um, we physically, you know, every so often dump the garbage trucks out on a big uh, plastic bin, and we look at what is in there, and we sort it all and say, well, what's left in the waste stream? So we looked at some of the things that we're, we're throwing away, and we identified two big areas that immediately were ready for action. Uh, the first one was food waste, and the second was building and construction demolition waste. So food waste was the single largest component of our waste stream that was being thrown away. And that's really pretty extraordinary when you think about it. And then there's the commercial side also, um, which is the restaurants and other places where food waste is generated. And there, we've been really relying heavily on the private sector um, by being able to manage the way in which the rates are charged. Um, we actually allow the private sector to have a great incentive to actually do the food waste composting in the restaurants and other places like that where food appears. Now, the other waste streams that I wanted to talk about that's the incredibly important is construction and demolition waste. And this is a, another great example of a situation where everybody can benefit if you move into more recycling. Right now, there, there's always been a fair amount of recycling done in construction and demolition waste because typically when somebody tears down a building, you know, there's some things that are pretty easy to recycle. But there were two reasons why people were not going into full-scale reuse of building materials in construction and demolition waste. One reason was that there's a lot of the material that is all mixed up. So when you demolish a building, you don't necessarily get out just one type of thing. And sometimes it seemed easier to just take all that stuff and throw it away, rather than having to sort through it. So what we've been trying to do is to encourage businesses to emerge that will actually create what are called pick lines, where you actually move the, the, all of the product into a single area, and then it can be separated. In some cases, that's even hand separation. In other cases, you can do it by, for example, using magnets to pull out your iron, things of that nature. The second part of it is we looked at, so what's the economic incentive uh, for people to actually uh, go ahead and recycle all this material? Well, it turned out that one of the things that happens is that when people are building a new building, we typically issued to them at the same day a permit to demolish the old building and a permit to start construction on the new building. So, since they were looking for the new building, the incentive was, let's demolish the old building as fast as possible so we can actually get construction going on the new building, and that way we'll be able to make money as fast as possible. The solution was pretty easy. We issue the demo demolition permit first, while they're still going through all the process they need to in order to get their new building permit approved, and then they'll have the economic incentive to start moving stuff off the site in an orderly and methodical manner. Just to make it clear, we also required them to, in order to get a demolition permit first, to submit a recycling plan as to how they're actually going to do it. Uh, if we had just jumped in and said, this is what we're going to do and you, know, you have to comply tomorrow, that would have been a challenge. But what we did is we engaged stakeholders, we brought them together into a meeting, we said, how can we make this work? Here's our goal. First they grump about the goal and then we say, but if you actually get to this goal, here's how we'll make it easy for you. And then they start thinking about it and then you get creative ideas about how to actually make it work. We, we do spot monitoring, you know, our, basically that with our garbage collectors do that. They flip the lid before they dump it. If they see something, they leave a little note saying, oh, you inadvertently have left some recyclables in there. We'll come back next week to get it. Please take the recyclables out. You know, we don't charge them extra for like now picking up two units of garbage. Um, so uh, it's, it's a soft sell. It's, a, it's an education emphasis rather than, you know, an enforcement emphasis. You know, say like for dumpsters, you know. We, we, we look at it, we, if we see a thing, we give a warning letter, okay. And we go in and educate our guy, you know, just doesn't drop a letter, you know, he, he's, 
he's a very uh, persuasive type of guy, you know. And um, and then re-examine at some point. There's still a problem. A second letter. So it's the the third letter comes with the with the fine. Well, a guy's pretty persuasive, you know. So um, now, could we have some more resources checking on dumpsters? Probably. Probably we won't want to do that. But. Uh, yeah, we're not out to put hides on the wall or marks on our gun belt or whatever the, whatever the macho phrase is, you know. Yesterday, we gave our first two tickets uh, for Styrofoam. Wow. And these people had, we'd interact with them like five times. So, including like three, you know, in-person visits. Oh, yeah, we're going to get rid. Yeah, well, yeah, here you go. So the Yellow Page Ordinance is an opt-out. If you would not like to get uh, 10 Yellow Pages a year, or if you would like to get 10 Yellow Pages a year, you would go to the web page, or you would call them, and you would specify exactly how many Yellow Pages you want and from which companies for your geographic area. Because, for example, in Seattle, some areas get four books, some areas get five books. It just depends where you live. The Yellow Page Association has their own web page where people can select their preferences, but the problem is, is we haven't seen that that's been honored. And even the city councilman, Mike O'Brien, received a Yellow Page book when he'd actually opted out, and they, he was sitting in his window on a Saturday afternoon, and they came by to bring him the book, and he's like, but wait a minute, I opted out. So the problem is the accountability. We're not trying to get rid of Yellow Pages, we just would like for people to have the choice of whether they want them or not. So many people told us that the minute the yellow page comes, they basically just put it right into their recycle bin. And even if 100% if of those are recycled, we spend about $300,000 a year recycling them. Um, and $300,000 a year for something we don't need in this time and economy, I'd rather spend that money on something else. Um, and that's just the yellow pages. What are all the other things that are costing us money? You know, when we talk about internalizing these external costs, um, you know, as a, as a business owner, what you're going to see is you're just making it more expensive for me to do business. And so that's always going to be a challenge to overcome. Um, the nice thing is in a place like Seattle, we have some really progressive businesses that, that um, you know, for their own business models, they see the future. You know, they look out more than, than a quarter or two. They look out years and say, wow, here's something coming down the pike, and this is an opportunity for us to get out in front of it. King County is lucky in some ways because we operate eight transfer stations and a major landfill. And so we have revenues, ironically, we, we have revenues coming in from the garbage that people dump. And so we use that money that people pay to dump their garbage for our education programs. And, and it's funny because my job is actually to reduce our agency's revenue in some ways. <laughs> and, but, but I, yeah, to work myself out of a job, but there's always going to be waste. And we're, I mean, we have, we have crews who work at our transfer stations and landfills and it's their job. But I, I think there's still going to be garbage coming in. And at least what I can do is to extend the life of our landfill through my work if we're successful, not just me, but everyone who does this education work. So that's something where we can help reserve the jobs of our crews out there doing that is keep our landfill lasting longer by putting less stuff in it. We try to reach the public any way we can, uh, TV, radio, social media, Twitter, Facebook, doing presentations. And in all of that, I do a lot of that myself. And we really try to make it fun for people. That's what will get them motivated. We use a lot of props. Here's one, for example, uh, recycled toilet paper. It's from office paper. It's the paper that that uh, we collect in our offices. Now, now, wouldn't that be a good use of your old IRS tax forms? In the last couple years, the tonnage at our landfill has been going down. Most of that, much of that, is probably due to the economy. But we like to think some of that is, is from education. And we, we know our recycling rate has been going up. We're, we're getting our message out there. People, people are supporting this. They're supporting the businesses that are selling the green products and services.